folks, welcome in. We are just about to get started. We are right at that 10 mark, and I want to be respectful of everyone's time. I'm going to pass the mic to Angelina to get us started. Angelina, you're on mute. I'm sorry. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Good morning. And thank you for joining us for the Health and Life Sciences Regional Advisory Meeting. Before we get started, I'm going to go through a couple of housekeeping. Next slide, please. So please enable your video camera. It's optional, but we would like, if you can, um, please uh, stay, stay on video. So we'd, we'd like to see your lovely faces. And also please stay on mute unless you're called on to ask a question. And then if you have any questions, the chat is open for networking and communicating and getting to know people on the call. And please um, submit all questions and commentary you have regarding the presentation and the information was, that was shared in the chat. And also this meeting will be recorded and will provide uh, part of, and will be provided as part of the post event meeting materials. And please take time after the meeting to complete a post-event survey. Thank you for joining us and I'll pass it to you, Isabel. Thanks so much, Angelina. Yeah, these advice are really an opportunity for us to connect. So please feel free to blow up our chat and introduce yourselves, connect um, and share contact information. Um, like Angelina said, my name is Isabel Gala Cruz and I'm a project manager here at Valley Vision for our workforce development portfolio. Um, the purpose really for today is we really want to connect you all. Uh, um, as an intro to Valley Vision and our workforce impact area, we serve as the regional convener and intermediary to facilitate employer and industry convenings, such as today's advisory meeting, to connect and align workforce stakeholders and support regional workforce efforts and economic planning. The purpose of today's event is really to connect and share information to strengthen our health and life sciences programs in our region and to prepare our workforce for growing biotechnology opportunities. Um, next slide, please. So today we did quick welcome and introductions. We'll have a presentation um, from Erin Wilcher from the Centers of Excellence for some labor market and trend analysis. And then we'll go into our lovely industry panel discussion to kind of talk about what those what that looks like out in the field today and what they predict that will look like in the future. And um, then we'll kind of talk about some of the, the supply chain, work, workforce supply chain opportunities um, with some education and training programs highlighted. And we'll conclude at 12 o'clock, which is five minutes to spare. Um, if you have any questions, again, please feel free to chat us. And I will pass them. Oh, we're moving, moving real quick, but we'll go um, to the next slide. Before I introduce our lovely um, speaker, I just want to do a quick shout out to all of our supporters. We're able to do this work due to the strong workforce portfolio uh, program through the California Community Colleges and Los Rios Community College District, the other community college districts within our region, as well as our regional workforce boards, um, SETA. Um, Yolo County, um, um, Golden Sierra, and our North um, programs. And I'll pass the mic now to Erin Wilcher from Centers of Excellence. Hi, good morning, everybody. Uh, can you see and hear me okay? Isabel? Yes, thanks yes. so much, Erin. Awesome. Uh, so with that, maybe we can go to the first slide in the presentation. Great, thanks. So I'm Aaron Wilshire. I'm the director of the Greater Sacramento Region Center of Excellence. We're a program that's funded by the Chancellor's Office Economic and Workforce Development Division. Um, and our goal is really to support the colleges uh, with their program uh, decision making and investments, especially around strong workforce program. And our goal is to um, align programs with high growth and high wage employment. We're a research organization and we provide labor market information and research services. 
uh, we frequently um, uh, go outside of the colleges into community partnerships, uh, such as the one we're working on today, and um, outline information that's helpful in uh, strategy and program development, um, such as what we're talking about today, which is um, biotech and life sciences. So let's go please to the next slide. So there's the greater Sacramento region. Um, I didn't mention that um, I'm one of nine uh, center directors around the state and with our team, um, we're guiding the, uh, the 116 uh, community colleges around the state. So there's the, the region that we cover. There's eight uh, community colleges in four districts in our greater Sacramento region. We're gonna look at some of the programs that um, are involved in this um, important industry sector towards the end of the presentation. Um, but first I'll be talking about the industry and its trends. Um, according to a statewide report that I'll mention here in a minute, there's seven key occupations that we um, have outlined um, on this. This work's been going on in our organization for quite a while. Um, it's referred to as the skilled technical workforce in the biosciences, uh, biotech and life sciences industries. Um, we'll look at jobs postings analysis, um, and then um, I'll wrap up with a few key takeaway highlight points. Next slide, please. So um, there's a report that I'd really uh, encourage you to take a look at. It was released um, last year. Um, our statewide director, Laura Coleman, headed this up. Um, with uh, the state's community colleges, life sciences and biotech <laughs> initiative. Um, this is a, a terrific report that um, outlines, um, as I will today, but in more detail, uh, industry trends and segments around the state, um, the occupation trends, um, lots on jobs postings, and an extensive program inventory for the related programs around the state um, that are touching on uh, this, this industry sector. So um, the data that I'm going to show you here today really borrows on the methods that they used in this report. And um, I'll, I'll talk about how they outline the industry here in a minute. Um, I do want to point out that this is sort of long-standing work that the COE has been involved in. Um, I worked in the Bay Area for quite a number of years, and um, my counterpart over there in San Francisco Bay Area, John Carice, um, worked extensively uh, since he's based at City College of San Francisco um, with the National Science Foundation Center on in biotech that they have there. So the work that's in this report is really a result of like many years of engagement with industry and school partners and um, focused on these occupations that um, industry partners have really outlined over the years as being the key um, skilled technical uh, uh, occupations um, that they're interested in. So there's a link to the report there. Again, I highly encourage you to take a look at that for more detail on what you're gonna see today. Next slide. So let's take a look at the industry data. Um, next slide, please. Uh, so the report and how we've been slicing this up um, really looks at uh, biotech and life sciences in these five key industry segments. So um, each one of these is a grouping of detailed industries. So um, the first one there, agricultural feedstock and industrial biosciences. These are things like um, ag production and processing, chemical and fertilizer manufacturing, and biofuels. Um, the distribution component is is really wholesale and uh, warehousing. Um, so how to you know how to deliver these uh, 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 products across the segments, drugs and pharmaceuticals uh, like biological and medicinal products, manufacturing of pharmaceuticals and diagnostics, medical devices and equipment. Um, so these are industries that manufacturing surgical and medical instruments and supplies, lab equipment ultrasound equipment, dental equipment, and then research testing and medical laboratories. And this is kind of the R&D side of things. And as you'll see, you know, as a result of the university, um, UC Davis, um, we're pretty uh, strong in this area. Um, and I'll make a couple of additional notes here in just a minute. So five segments, keep these in mind as we're looking at the detailed data. Next slide, please. 
So here's some detailed data. This is industry data. Uh, the topped table that we're looking at here, again, these five industry segments, and we're counting jobs. The top table is the greater Sacramento region. This is a six county Sacramento region. The bottom table is California. So this is a way to kind of look at and compare the performance and the strength of the Sacramento region's um, life sciences and biotech industry as compared to California. Uh, the, and this is all jobs in the industry. We're gonna look at occupational data in a minute, but this is, this is the industry employment. So you'll note a couple of different things here. I mean, number one is, you know, the number of jobs in SAC regions kind of small. I mean, you know, by comparison, 9,500 jobs. The location quotient, this is 2021 I'm citing now. So this is like the most present um, baseline data that we're talking about right now. The location quotient, which is a measure of concentration of employment in a geography is also kind of limited in greater Sacramento region. Um, that's the second column from the right. Basically what that's saying is the concentration of employment in SAC regions, generally like half of what national levels are, um, which is a little low. Uh, it means we don't have a lot of concentration here. The strongest LQ is for R&D, again, that university influence. And I know there's been some discussion about the efforts to get like commercialization activities going a lot more in SAC area, like getting that um, R&D translated into, into product development services and so forth. So, you know, what are we looking at here? And we know the biotech centers in California are in the metro area, San Diego, especially LA, San Francisco Bay Area. You know, go to South of Market in San Francisco sometime and uh, see all the fun companies that are down there. Um, but I do want to point out the growth trends here in SAC region. So if you look at, you know, the third column over there from the right that I highlighted, that's some pretty significant growth going on. I mean, 2016 to 2021, several of the industries growing 21% uh, for um, research, testing, and medical laboratories, 33% medical devices and equipment, 50% in drugs and pharmaceuticals. Um, you know, overall, the growth trend is on par with the state. I mean, this is kind of meaning that SAC region is probably this up and coming biotech and life sciences um, set of industries. The earnings are high, <laughs> uh, very high. I mean, when you compare this to other industries, but they're a little lower than the state overall, meaning that, you know, when folks are probably looking around for jobs, um, they're going to fit SAC region employers uh, may be facing some competition. However, uh, these are strong numbers. That's a good sign in terms of the health of the industry. Next slide, please. So this, this slide just points out the growth trends that historically 2016 to 2021, the green line that we're, this is an index. So it just, you know, baselines the employment to 2016 and we can look at the growth rates. It's a good way to compare things in um, simple fashion. On the left, we're looking at the greater Sacramento region. On the right, the Cal um, state of California. The green line is biotech and life sciences, those five industry segments put together. The black line is the um, industry overall. And, you know, you could see in SAC region, this is like a little bit volatile somewhat, um, like if we we're looking at this in terms of like investments, but this is, these are jobs numbers, right? But you see a little dip in 2017, you see another dip in uh, 2020, but then this big spike in uh, between 2020 and 2021. And the index number there, that's just the same one that I just cited. So you could see it's virtually the same number as the state, the growth uh, of employment, it, it's about 20% over uh, 2016 job levels. But California just kind of like trundled right along in growth, strong growth mode. There was very little dip um, in 2020 as a result of the pandemic. Um, so California might be a little bit more resilient, um, but you know, small jobs numbers, kind of like emerging industry, stuff like this, um, you know, the trend line on the left might make a little more sense if we're an emerging industry. Uh, next slide, please. 
so this is the five industry segments just split out in terms of um, the distribution of jobs for each one of the segments. There's a couple of things to note here. I know there's a lot of detail on this slide, but again, the strength of the research testing in medical laboratories probably as a result of the university. Um, it's 10 percentage points higher than the distribution in California on the right, 53% in SAC region versus 43% on the right. Um, and then you know, we could see that uh, drugs and pharmaceuticals and medical devices um, have a lower content, uh, lower percentage of the overall employment in SAC region, five and 10% lower respectively. Um, and then ag feedstock and biosciences is a little higher in SAC region, not surprising given we're in the Central Valley and uh, again, UC Davis um, influence. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so let's look at some occupational data and I'm just gonna take a drink of water real quick. So this is clipped right from that statewide report. And again, I just wanna kind of note the orientation here. The concept of selecting these occupations um, as they call out in the report is called this skilled technical workforce. And basically the idea here, you'll, if you attend our presentations on a regular basis, you'll, you'll sort of hear us talk about middle skilled jobs ad nauseum. This is a little different type of concept. The idea here is um, still a focus on middle skills um, and middle skill are those occupations requiring post-secondary education, but less than a bachelor's degree. But um, what we're focused on here is really these sort of technical STEM jobs that are gonna be focused on laboratory and manufacturing technology. Um, again, this has been really developed in, in partnership over the years with industry uh, partners. You'll see this in the jobs postings and partly by contrast, uh, we know that these industries have lots of other middle skill jobs and we'll see some of those these when we look at the jobs postings. But the idea here is like these focused lab sort of technician type jobs, manufacturing technology, um, like compliance, quality assurance, things like that. Um, you can see some of these occupations here. So biological technicians, chem tech, food science technicians, um, manufacturing uh, production technicians, clinical lab techs, um, quality control analysts. We're gonna see some numbers on these here in a second. Um, the report also notes uh, these pathway occupations. So you can see right away, these are pretty high end level um, jobs in um, uh, you know, um, science, in STEM. These require at least a bachelor's degree, often beyond that, uh, biochemists, uh, biomedical engineers, biostatisticians, I won't read this whole list. Um, I didn't pull data on this for today, but the idea here, as with all pathways, is that you know, with additional education and experience, these are potentially occupations that folks could move into. Um, I do wanna point out, and I may have it in my notes for later in the presentation, but the report, the statewide report does note that quite a number of uh, students who come into our programs, um, at the community colleges already have a bachelor's degree. It's something like 20% of those folks. So, so there's people kind of going both ways and there's some significant upskilling going on in this industry um, from people who already have bachelor's degrees. Uh, just last thing I'll note on this, these notes on the right-hand side, the statewide report notes the pathway occupations, these, these um, higher level um, you know, bachelors and above are 2X in terms of the numbers of jobs, um, like 45,000. Whereas on the left, uh, the entry level occupations, it's a little tricky. Those are mostly middle skill in nature, but they're, they're called entry level. There's 21,000 jobs there. Um, uh, same thing, 2X, the number of openings and the pay is like more than $20 an hour higher on the right hand side. Pretty highly skilled industry, not surprising given kind of what's going on here. Um, lots of R&D uh, product development, so forth, um, services, et cetera. Um, next slide. 
so same same idea here but instead of looking at industries we're looking at occupations now and um you know on the greater sacramento region side um the overall these are the seven uh entry level middle skill uh level uh, occupations that we were just talking about and these uh Comprise these amounts here represent about 6,000 jobs in, from 2021, again, that baseline year. Um, the largest uh, one of these is these inspectors, sorters, uh, testers, and weighers is sort of like core entry level manufacturing occupation. Clinical lab techs is the next largest. Um, altogether, these seven, these seven occupations uh, represent um, just under 700 projected annual openings. Um, this is just sort of, you know, um, economics projections around the, uh, the occupations, um, how many annual openings as a result of new jobs and turnover, there's going to be retirement, stuff like that, and the 4% projected growth rate. So statewide, you know, you can see the numbers way bigger, uh, 135,000 jobs, um, and, you know, more than 15,000 annual openings. The distribution of the jobs is similar. In other words, you know, which ones uh, have the largest share? It's about the same. 0% uh, uh, growth projected. Uh, so that's a, a bit in interesting. Um, and at any rate, uh, one thing I want to note here, if you look at this statewide report, um, these numbers are, are different. And the reason for that is, uh, gets a little technical, but they um, slice these up by staffing patterns. So um, what that means is they um, limit their counting on occupations to uh, just those, uh, that employment that's in bio uh, biotech and life sciences. I, I didn't do that here, partly was because I just didn't have time. Uh, but um, I do think it's important to look at these overall numbers because, you know, around here, these sorts of workers are not just going to be working in biotech and life sciences, but they're going to be working in like government agencies and staple industries like hospitals and healthcare. care. So, um, you know, when we train these folks in the programs that are relevant to biotech and life sciences, they're going to be employable elsewhere, too. <laughs> And um, so let's let's please remember that um, biotech's important. Uh, it says uh, you know making sure that our our students have job opportunities in all kinds of places. Um, next slide. Um, okay, so this is we're talking about um, hourly wages in the seven occupations. Um, Greater Sac. This is also encouraging from like a competitiveness standpoint because uh, the SAC region um, wages in these uh, core seven occupations are not that much lower than state level. Um, and, uh, you know, the range here we're looking at, um, we talk about the, you know, we're able to estimate the wage ranges um, for these occupations, like 19 to $31 an hour in SAC region. Um, and uh, again, slightly higher for California. I put the self-sufficiency wage uh, level just below that, that's just like a basket of goods measure, you know, how much does it cost based on the size of family and so forth, um, based on your rent and other household expenses. You can see it's still a little bit lower than that um, between the two, except at the upper levels. But I would say these are really pretty good. I mean, like when we look around at all the different middle skill occupations that we do lots of reports on, this is pretty strong. Uh, I mean, this is one of these industries um, like healthcare, uh, you know, uh, water um, and wastewater occupations where, you know, there's, there's particular training. There's a reason colleges are interested in this. There's kind of a pathway, specific training, good wages. Um, this is, a, this is a, a good place to be for colleges. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so let's look at some jobs postings here. Uh, next slide. Um, let me prompt our panelists on the next slide, but, you know, this is a typical thing we'll do here is like measure jobs, postings, volumes. And um, here we've done that in those, we're back to industries now. So these are the five industry segments that we talked about. And we just kind of look at these trend lines. Um, if nothing else, they look cool. Uh, I'm making a joke. 
Uh, it's a data joke, um, probably not a very good one. Uh, but, you know, uh, looking at these jobs, postings, volumes, uh, these are 12 month bases and like over five years to see just kind of what what the jobs postings are doing in those industry segments. Um, and I mean, you can see generally they're going up, right? I mean, there's a little dip in a couple cases, maybe as a result of the pandemic. Um, sometimes you could say this is maybe like a proxy for demand or something. I think it's just something to kick against. It, it, it doesn't necessarily mean too much. Uh, but it does give you an additional data point. Um, the largest uh, segment that's posting in both the state and uh, SAC region uh, is this uh, research uh, testing and medical laboratory. So again, there that R&D part is where most of the jobs postings volumes are. Um, in the other industries kind of just fall out from there. The one that's at the bottom is that agricultural feedstock and industrial biosciences. And that's not surprising because that's like the smallest segment of all of them. Um, next slide, please. So on this one, I do want to prompt the industry panel. I mean, here's here we're going to go into some detail about the jobs postings. And, and this is where I sort of would want to invite our panelists to kind of um, look at these uh, as as much as you can uh, in the in the you know little bit of time on each one of these, but to note things that you're seeing about what's emerging here uh, in terms of this slide is, are the top uh, posting employers in the region and the state uh, for the last 12 months. So through October, 2022. Um, these are the way this we did this was um, all industries in those five segments and the seven key occupations on the left-hand side. Uh, and then on the right-hand side, it's all occupations in the industries. So, you know, just one thing to point out here is when you limit it to the seven key occupations that we talked about, those, you know, skilled technical workforce, you can see there's kind of a small number of jobs postings here, just over 100. Uh, when you open it up to all occupations in biotech and life sciences, it's like more than 2,000 uh, jobs postings. This is just what floated to the top in terms of top employers. So Eurofin Scientific, Quest Diagnostics, Millipore Sigma um, on the left, Quest Diagnostics, uh, Eurofin Scientific, Jackson Laboratory, and so forth. I won't read the whole list. Um, I call this the Angelina list, uh, Angelina, because I highlighted uh, the some of those uh, companies that you had been re researching um, in, in your in your preparation for this uh, program. So. Um, there's many, many more uh, listed here. These are just the ones that, that float to the top um, for display. Next slide. So um, these are the top occupations in the postings. So those uh, jobs postings, they don't list occupations, but the software um, bundles up the keywords and then tells us what occupations the postings correspond to. Um, on the left, these are just the uh, these are the main uh, occupations that we included in the criteria. On the right hand side, um, it's the occupations that floated to the top in those 2000 when I didn't put the criteria in for the seven occupations. Here's what I meant by there are more middle skill uh, jobs in these industries than just the seven skilled technical workforce, for example, maintenance and repair workers. I mean, if you look down this list, all these companies need like a lot of staple stuff that isn't like technical lab work. <laughs> you still need people doing sales. Um, you still need healthcare workers. You still need marketing people, et cetera. And so, you know, this is not something to forget either. It's just that we're, again, you know, focused on these trainings that are like um, for manufacturing technology and um, lab technicians. Um, so some of these things you might want to note for the discussion. Um, next slide. Uh, so top job titles for 
uh, again, the key seven occupations in the greater Sacramento region, and then um, all occupations in um, uh, the greater Sacramento region for biotech and life sciences. This is what flowed to the top. So you see there's like phlebotomist, field service tech, uh, production planner, uh, again, sales, lots of customer service. I mean, lots of staple things. Uh, that it takes to make a business run, particularly when you're in the manufacturing um, sector. Um, on the left, the things here are more focused again on the skilled technical workforce, lab analyst, quality control, lab coordinator, medical lab technician, quality assurance, and so forth. Next slide. So now we're looking at top skills. So just, you know, going down the funnel of detail here and same thing on the left side, uh, seven key occupations on the right, um, all the uh, occupations in the biotech and life sciences industries. Um, on the left, quality assurance and control, manufacturing processes, quality management, specimen processing, lab testing, et cetera, down the list, giving you just a few seconds to study it, uh, customer service. These slides, of course, are available um, in the follow-on notes. Um, the Valley Vision does such a great job of putting together on the right-hand side, customer service, vac vaccination, project management. You know, this is a, a kind of a lot of stuff thrown together from all the occupations, but you could just see kind of what floats to the top. Um, next slide, please. Uh, this slide, and we're, we're getting towards the end here. I just have a few more slides to go. Is um, this slide represents the jobs postings that are cited for those same postings? So same idea on the left. The seven key occupations. You could see this is kind of interesting. I mean, many of these are calling for a bachelor's degree, um, and and so uh, as we know, there's there's um, you know, that might be a minimum point of entry. Um, some folks are coming back into our schools to get upskilled uh, in the community colleges, um, but some require just a high school or um, vocational training. So that's also uh, like community college opportunity area. On the right-hand side, this is heavily bachelor's degree um, with some advanced degrees and then high school and vocational training. Um, next slide. So we attempted to do something here in the jobs postings, which was, and, and I'm not sure we were successful, but we can return to it later. What we wanted to do was see which companies are kind of popping up that are driving some of this growth, those big, you know, 20, 30, 50% uh, growth trends. And our panelists, I'm sure, can illuminate who those are and what's going on in industry. Um, but these were the uh, companies in each one of the five industry segments that were most commonly showing up in the past five years when we did the annual analysis. And uh, so, you know, drugs and pharmaceuticals, Johnson & Johnson, um, medical devices, Thermo, Fisher Scientific, Agilent, uh, research testing, Bear Quest, et cetera. And I will note something we I, I didn't ground truth this, uh, but we've got a lot of stuff going on because of the way the jobs postings work. Sometimes remote work jobs can pop up even if there's not an office in the area. Um, so at any rate, just I want to point that out. If you see something or like, hey, there's not an office in Sacramento, there's a, there's a reason for that with this data. Um, there's a couple points here, which is like Eurofins was a new a newcomer to the postings uh, sometime in the last couple of years. And then JR Simplot and company also new. So again, we tried to do this analysis, something we can return to later. Um, next slide. So education and training programs here in the last couple of slides. Uh, next slide. Again, there's this great, uh, the statewide report has this great sort of inventory of all the programs across the state. There's three to take note of here around um, Sacramento area. Uh, Sacramento City College has a chem tech program. 
uh, both associates degrees and certificates. Um, and, you know, they have uh, sequence of certificates, beginning, intermediate, advanced, and it's targeting lab tech roles in various different industries. Again, when you look at these occupations, uh, many of them are, are working beyond biotech and life sciences. Do you want to point out, like, you know, in terms of supply demand gap, pretty low number of credentials when you look at the last five years, just three associates and six certificates on average. ARC has the biotech program in our area, AS and certificate program. You could read here, it's uh, very specific on bioscience industry, R&D, testing, diagnostics uh, for, the, for these different industries we've talked about. Again, pretty somewhat low number, 10 associates and four certificates. Um, FLC, Folsom Lake has the medical lab tech program. Uh, preparing students for work in medical laboratories. Um, they have a license exam they prepare for, an industry-recognized credential, a medical lab technician, um, lab assistant, et cetera. They do have a preclinical certificate, but the data that we counted was 11 associate's degrees, and there's a reason I'm pointing out these number of degrees for the next slide. Because if we go back to our occupation data analysis, and that handy thing called the projected annual openings, you can see there's like almost 700 annual openings for those seven key skilled technical workforce occupations. And uh, somebody can do the math quicker than me in their head, but um, that's way bigger than these number of uh, credentials that we're able to count from these three programs. Now, this is not a perfect science, but um, you know, just comparing the number of credentials the number of annual openings, we might, you know, be led to believe that there's a lot of opportunity here that's not being filled um, from the education training viewpoint. Um, the statewide report makes those indications like, hey, we this is a business maybe we should return to and, and look at for priority. Um, some of the growth that's going on uh, around the region is encouraging. So let's go maybe to the last slide here, the key takeaways. So just kind of wrapping up here, SAC region growth rates and earnings are on par with California. The employment and location quotient is smaller. I mean, this is not a biotech, uh, you know, Shangri-La, uh, but we may be on our way. Um, those, you know, growth rates are strong. And um, I, I think some of our economic development partners are kind of focused on this. Uh, this Skilled technical workforce is small for the five segments, uh, but the related occupations have hundreds of annual openings. That's the number we just looked at. Uh, wages for entry level middle skill occupations, um, pretty good, 19 to $31 an hour with a median around 25 bucks an hour. Um, and these three core programs, um, maybe, maybe room to grow. Uh, let's see. Um, data indicates there's significant related employment in other industries beyond biotech and life sciences. So if we, you know, did the staffing patterns on those seven core occupations, uh, we we would find other industries again that that um, have demand for those, particularly in our our area of competitiveness, uh, <laughs> the government. Um, Small numbers of awards um, invites further investigation. So I'm re just real curious to hear from the panel and um, others in the discussion about what you're seeing. Um, and and please do check out that statewide report. My contact info is on the last slide. I'm, I'm sticking around for the rest of this. And um, uh, thanks for your time. I really appreciate it. And I um, uh, hope we have a good rest of the program. We're, we're going to have a good rest of the program. Thank you. Thanks so much, Erin. Really lays a great background for our panel discussion uh, coming up next and really appreciate, that appreciate the work that you did to pull that data for us. Um, if we could advance to the next slide. Um, uh, we are gonna move into that industry panel discussion. I'm really honored to introduce this fabulous panel of experts in our area. Um, first off, we have Craig Bush, an Associate Director of Service Sales and Operations at Nolente Biotech, and he has worked nationally and internationally in Europe and North America, starting his career as just a pipe 
pipette calibration technician. He's had 30 years of experience as a service operations manager in the biotechnology industry and working in operations management, scientific devices, quality management, and calibration. Uh, second, we have Damian Curtis, the Director of Synthetic Biology and Genomics at BioConsortia Incorporated. Uh, Damian has 15 years of experience in product research and development, and he is a skilled molecular biologist, biochemist, and microbiologist. And then next we have Laura Kramer at the head of global, um, she's the head of global pipeline digital operations at Bayer Crop Science. And she started her career at Bayer 13 years ago, growing and leading the newly formed vegetable trait integration team. Most recently, Lara leads the vegetable R&D analytics and pipeline design. Uh, really excited to hear from all three. We also have Barry Kirsting. He's joining us today. He has 24 years of experience in biotechnology industry. In his current role as the director of manufacturing at Hygia Biological Laboratories, he oversees four production laboratory teams, as well as three operation departments, and also serves on the executive team. He received his BS in microbiology from UC Davis and credits his broad experience to working at small companies with a culture of collaboration across the departments and with countless mentors and colleagues who invested in him. I wanna make sure we have that for our students as well. And then last but not least, we have Laura Nisnik williams She's the Director of Government and Community Relations at UC Davis Health. She's been with UC Davis Health for close to 15 years and has led uh, various efforts in K through 12 career pathway programming, uh, bringing students and healthcare professionals together to learn about allied healthcare um, careers. She's also advocated for healthcare workforce at the White House Department of Labor and Health and Human Services, and was uh, leading the workforce planning for the future of Ag Aggie Square Project, a public-private partnership between UC Davis, the City of Sacramento, and Wexford Science and Technology to build an innovation hub focused on life sciences and biotechnology. Uh, Aggie Square is uh, phase one is slated to open its doors in early 2025. So excited to learn more about this upcoming event. And then to transition a little bit outside of slides, I'm going to ask Gustavo to um, take away sharing for a moment. We'll be in the Brady Bunch tiles, kind of open this up to a discussion. We have some prompted questions for this awesome panel, and then we'll uh, provide some time for folks to ask any, ask any additional questions they may have. So again, welcoming folks to turn on their um, cameras if they feel inclined to, um, just so that we can have that feeling of togetherness in this conversation. Um, and then to start, I'm gonna um, ask our panelists to provide a, pr a brief overview of their organization, their role, and kind of a little bit about the background of their workforce. Um, and so I'll start off with uh, Laura. Hi, good morning, everyone. Um, I think you did a great job in uh, giving my bio as to what, <laughs> what I do, but I know it sounds strange having a director of government and community relations for UC Davis Health talking about biosciences, but a lot of my work over the last 15 years at UC Davis Health has focused a lot on the K through 12 sector. And um, I know I see some familiar faces out there in Zoom land of people I've worked with in the past and bringing students and our industry professionals and university professionals together to be able to um, help expose students to potential careers in the healthcare field. Um, where I'm kind of shifting and hoping to do my focus today is to look at the Aggie Square project. And some of you may have heard this as a buzzword out in the community, um, but yes, it is a partnership between the city of Sacramento, the university, as well as Wexford Science and Technology, which is our development partner. And this kind of came out as a, of an idea that our chancellor, Gary May, had when he was at Georgia Tech. They had Tech Square, which was an innovative Innovation Center where they kind of came out into the community and put together a um, research and innovation hub. And that's what we're looking to uh, do here in Sacramento. So the chancellor uh, partnered with uh, the city of Sacramento mayor, Daryl Steinberg back in, I think it was 2017 to kind of come up with this idea of how do we build an innovation hub in the life and biosciences sector and bringing university resources and industry together. 
And I think what's really great about this particular project, not only will you have um, folks from industry and, and the university coming together, but it's also opening a place for community. So we're looking at um, an increased number of jobs in a lot of different spaces. I think everything that Aaron said in those sectors are potentially tenants that we would have within Aggie Square. And so I think, um, you know, I, I don't want to take up everybody's time because I know we have a lot of panelists, but um, I'm hoping through the course of this conversation, we could talk a little bit more about the potential opportunities that will be coming up. Thanks so much, Laura. Um, I'll pass the mic next to Laura Kramer. Sorry for the confusion on that. Yeah, no problem. Yeah, it's always a little bit of a challenge with uh, the missing uh, you and my name. <laughs> so. Um, so I'll give you a little bit of background on myself. So um, I actually started out going to school thinking I was going to be a, a psychiatrist, a psychologist. And during my undergrad, um, really loved kind of the, the science, hardcore science pieces. Um, I ended school and, you know, I wasn't really sure what I wanted to do. And I actually was a technician um, in a biotech lab for a while that worked on blood and blood products, so in the medical uh, field. And then I've always been very interested in, in agriculture. And so I decided to go back to school and, and go down that path. And that's the path I've been following for the last 13 years or so. And, and I've really enjoyed um, working for Bayer. And uh, my PhD was in actually working on potatoes. And so I have a lot of background in vegetables. Um, and, and so I ended up uh, working here in California, right? This is a, a huge opportunity, a state for us that produces most of the fruits and vegetables that reach everybody across the United States and globally in the world. Um, so just a quick overview of Bayer, right? You, you know, my path led here through the agricultural space, but Bayer supports crop science. And then the other, the, the larger part of our business is pharmaceuticals and consumer health. So overall Bayer, our vision is health for all, hunger for none. And our purpose is science for a better life. And so just a quick overview of kind of Bayer um, at a glance, we basically employ around 100,000 people worldwide across I think 83 or 84 different countries and these can be represented by different parts of the business and um, there's a huge reinvestment back into our R&D side of the business and and our sales are around 44 billion so as I mentioned I've been in in the crop science side and out of the that 100,000 employees around um, 33,000 are in the agriculture crop science space. Um, and, and I did a little, little bit of digging too. And, you know, so I'm based out here in Woodland, California. So this is one of our major hubs and sites for research for vegetables. Um, but we have many other sites across California that support our finance, pharmaceutical business as well. So the, quite a few in the Bay Area um, as well. So um, I'll turn it over to the next panelist. Thanks, Laura. I'm going to pass it on to Craig. Thanks for that comprehensive look into your group and sharing your experience um, going through the field. Hi, everybody. Good morning. Um, I'm Craig Bush. Um, my, my pathway to here um, has been kind of from the ground up. So I kind of started from one of these entry level positions, a pipette calibration technician, uh, learned to, to do the job in the laboratory um, where we had our sort of calibration facility and then learned to be um, an on-site field service engineer doing that. Managed to work my way up to far more complex pieces of equipment. And what I can say is that the industry as a whole, the scientific equipment supply industry has been, has been a really good industry to be part of. Um, there are a ton of kind of broader aspects of pieces of equipment that are in laboratories. So I kind of worked my way through pipette calibration to um, HPLC, FPLC, 
um, mass spec, um, flow cabinets, PCR machines. So pretty much everything you see in laboratories is kind of something and a pathway that people can kind of move on to. And um, there are a ton of industries that supply to these big um, bioscience companies. And it's kind of another separate industry. We saw in some of the job uh, postings that field service technicians were, were very strong. And that's very much the, the whole um, industry flow for me is it's actually being able to support that and bring uh, a team together that can support these instruments. Now, I'm currently working for Miltony Biotech, which is a relatively young company formed in around um, 1989. And it's based around um, somebody's um, doctoral thesis, a guy called Stefan Miltony. It's still a privately owned uh, company owned by him. And he came up with a very unique uh, magnetic antibody cell separation technology that allows us to, to separate cells. So the company is kind of founded on that and flourished through cell separation, cell sorting, and leading it into kind of cell and gene therapy. Um, we kind of have uh, outreach now into kind of biomanufacturing, biomedicine, very much working towards kind of um, cancer, autoimmune diseases, and neurodegenerative disorders. Um, the company currently is about 4,000 strong globally, uh, headquartered in Germany still in Bergisch Gladbach. Um, the US headquarters used to be here in Auburn, um, but the Auburn facility here now is predominantly the HQ for service operations. We have customer for, uh, support facilities here, inventory and control management, and some finance openings. So when we kind of post positions out of this area, typically um, it's, it's in those roles, it's customer service, it's finance, and it's kind of back office operations. We have a few technical openings here occasionally, uh, instrument technicians, and sometimes field service and service support engineers are what we're typically looking for. Uh, currently the service organization is about 60 strong and uh, here probably only about 10 people um, are actually on site physically in Auburn. Most of the majority of them are out in the field and probably we're the second largest group within the organization in North America. The biggest one being the sales part of the organization. So again, those sales jobs, very strong within the industry, but again, they tend to be spread nationally across the country. And that's it, thank you. Thanks Craig for that insight, really appreciate it. I'm going to pass the mic to Barry Kirsting. Hi, thank you. And uh, I want to thank Aaron for the presentation. I thought it was very uh, insightful uh, for, for a lot of, I do a lot of hiring uh, myself and, and sometimes we struggle to find some of the data to see where, where we're at uh, in line with other uh, employers in the Sacramento area. So I really appreciated uh, that presentation. Um, a little bit uh, about uh, the organization I work for is Hygia Biological Labs. We're located in Woodland. We're a fairly uh, small company, um, a lot smaller than uh, Craig and Lara's. Uh, so we have about 75 people uh, working for our company. We are a privately held company, more similar to Craig. Uh, it was founded by Jim and Dale Wallace uh, over 30 years ago. Uh, so they uh, have some veterinary and biotech background themselves. Uh, they still own and uh, run, run the show uh, here today. Uh, I've been with the company here about 14 years uh, in various development and management roles. Um, currently, uh, I, my umbrella kind of extends to about half of the company. Uh, most of that is scientific staff, uh, so about 30, 35 people, somewhere around in there, um, mostly on the manufacturing side. Uh, another about quarter to a third of our company is research science staff. Uh, and then we have uh, the rest of our staff, probably about a dozen or so, is on the admin, sales and marketing, um, accounting, other support type of type of roles. So a large chunk of our um, staff is in the lab, uh, are on the science side. Um, uh, I guess that's, uh, I'll, I'll end with that for now, for, for question one, thanks. No, that's a great beginning, Barry. Thank you so much. And then last but not least, I'll pass it to Damian Curtis. Hi, everyone. Uh, thanks for having me. Um, let's see. 
I, I came up kind of uh, as an RA technician after finishing my PhD, uh, my bachelor's where I did spend a couple of years at community college. So that's the number one driver why I wanted to be a part of this. Uh, it was an important part of my educational history. And I worked in the Bay Area during kind of the biotech boom of the late 90s, early 2000s, and fell in love with science and industrial sciences in particular. And it went to Oregon to get a PhD. And I've been in the um, Davis sort of Sacramento area for the last 10 years after I finished my PhD. Uh, my my experience has been largely uh, either in the lab, uh, technical lead, or leading teams as, as my career has progressed, focusing on biological agricultural products. Those are products that are derived from bacteria and fungi, so most of what I do is around um, small microorganisms and agriculture. So again, a good place for, for where we're seeing the industry jobs, um, particularly around agriculture. Um, and then most recently, I lead a small team here in Davis at a biotechnology company, again, focusing on developing biologicals. Uh, but we've stepped into some of the modern uh, strain engineering techniques that are particularly used in microbes that have developed over the last 10 or 20 years uh, in some of their smaller startups and, and now really transitioning into larger companies uh, in, in various areas, including agriculture. But uh, obviously seeing movement in synthetic biology and food uh, sciences and, and alternative uh, sweeteners, things like that. Um, I, I think this is the most um, of most interest to me is learning and providing information about hiring. Um, uh, even though we're small, I've, I've sort of had a lot of turnover the last two years in my new role and constantly trying to hire uh, at multiple levels um, within the organization and also supporting hiring um, and other functional groups within the group, within the team. And the other aspect of my career that's really important to me uh, and I feel very good about is that over the last 10 years or so, I've mentored and tra helped uh, transition uh, work closely with PhDs and postdocs, which is a, maybe a different hiring group than, than this topic of conversation, as they've made the decision to come out of academia and go into industrial sciences. And so I've hired, uh, been on steering committees. Um, I've also worked closely with the DEB department at UC Davis uh, for the last 10 years, uh, just serving as a person who people call and ask questions about their experience, because I also uh, made that transition as well. So uh, happy to be here and looking forward to the conversations. Thanks so much, Damien. Really appreciate like the breadth and diversity of all of your experiences and expertise um, to hopefully round out and support the, our education and workforce folks um, in the room today and who will be listening later on. Um, uh, our second question is kind of in response to Aaron's data and what you're seeing in the field. Um, biotechnology is such a like fun and uh, exciting word. Um, but we want to know what what those positions look like. What are those positions, and what are you uh, that you're currently hiring for? Maybe they're not even titled under. They don't even have the word biotechnology in it. You're in interested in understanding that uh, nomenclature, and what are the skills and competencies you're looking for in potential hires, both um, with soft skills and uh, technical skills. And I'll pass the mic to Barry this time. Uh, thanks. Uh, yeah, so uh, I was what I was interested. I, I, I was trying not to be offended in in Aaron's presentation that Hygia was not listed as one of the top um, hiring companies in the industry um, or in the Sacramento area. Um, I, so I went back and looked, and and we've actually hired about nineteen scientific staff in the last twelve months, um, and this this ranges from. Uh, a lot of these for, for us it might be different from what Damien was talking about, right? And I think this is a good distinction um, where if, if he's focused on a lot of PhD candidates, uh, more on the research side, Hygieia is primarily a primarily a, a manufacturing facility for veterinary biologics. We are hiring a lot of entry-level positions. Um, and I was, uh, when uh, Isabel talked about the nomenclature, uh, we, we talked about this as we, we set up a, a few years ago uh, kind of our, our career path. And, and we debated within our staff what to call like the, the very, very entry level position, maybe not even a bachelor degree. And we settled on that position as being called a technician level. And someone with a bachelor's degree, we settled on an assistant level. So you can fill in the, the word before or the word after. Either it's a research technician or my, microbiology technician um, or production technician versus a production assistant. Uh, so we made that distinction. I, I Probably different companies have that flipped and I understand that. 
um, from, from where we landed on that, but that's what we decided uh, just for, for a number of different reasons. But primarily that's, uh, I would say 80, 90% of the positions we are hiring for are in that technician to assistant level. Um, and that would look like um, either a high school or a community college person, a uh, student who's had um, a science training, maybe an AA degree or an AS in one of these specialized biotech programs from somewhere like Solano or um, American River, some of these that have more of these biotech programs at, at a community college, absolutely. I, I would hire them in um, almost equivalent to a bachelor's degree type of level um, because I'm more worried or I'm more focused on the type of training and education they have. Not, I don't need, I don't need that bachelor's degree I don't need that BS after their name. An AA after their name is fine for me. Um, so it really depends um, on, on the position that comes up. A lot of times we find that people with a four-year degree are applying for our technician level, which is the slightly lower level. Um, and, and they come in and very often it's a way for them to get their foot in the door. A, six months, a year later, we have a position open up and they, they can transfer over pretty easily. And, and that's happened probably four or five times just in the last 12 months. Um, it does cause this bit of a revolving door for us, uh, but I feel that's a, a good way to help. I, I think it's part of our company's responsibility to, to develop these people. We get them in, um, they do some of the grunt work, honestly, some of the grunt work tasks, um, they, they learn the routines and then, then we reward them and, and we're able to promote them into a, a higher level and it sets them off on what we call our career path and they see that progression through there. Um, I know Isabel wanted us to, to kind of touch on the technical skills that we're looking for, uh, for some of the staff. Whenever, we, we do a lot of um, recruiting through UC Davis. They do a lot of career fairs on campus. Whenever we talk to students there, we really um, just really, really focus in on encouraging them to get internships. So coursework, uh, classroom, lecture kind of style coursework, is one thing on in the science field, but I really feel strongly that the hands-on experience is needed. And sometimes even a laboratory course um, may or may not, uh, I've been out of college for, for a number of years, a couple, you know, 20 years or so now. Um, when I went through that program, it was not necessarily industry, um, it was more research-based and not necessarily industry-based kind of skills um, that we were learning in the laboratory courses. Uh, so a lot of times uh, students or prospective employees can gain those in an internship where they're working at a company or working at an intern, uh, at a re even a research lab on campus somewhere. Um, just those hands-on experiences, um, working with pipettes, pH meters, um, a PCR machine, just getting those things is, is really, really important. That's something that we'll look for um, on, on, a res on a resume or ask during an interview process. I'll, I'll leave it at that for now. I'll let other people jump in. Thanks so much, Barry, for starting us off and really hope to connect you to our community college partners in the room today since that entry level, um, our middle skill focus is really um, supplying your organization, really good opportunities there. I'll pass the mic to Laura. Yeah, so I think um, across there we're we're very similar. So we have you know a wide range of opportunities that are available globally, and we also do use that that same type of terminology. So entry level um, technicians, um, and then moving up into kind of an assistant associate level, um, and then moving into kind of heads and or directors. And um, you know it's nice about Bayer as well as is, is they do use a kind of a formal system for us to help kind of manage the different levels, um, skill levels and jobs available globally. So they use the formal Hay grading methodology. And so that helps to kind of really um, give a standardized, more I think scientific method of, of kind of laying out the, the expectations for anybody entering uh, Bayer. And as you go in and you search for jobs within the Bayer site, um, we're very intentional about listing required qualifications and then what's desired. And, and so that really helps to anybody looking for, for a job within our organization can see 
Okay, this is really what you have to have to even be considered for that role. Um, and then there's, you know, of course, there's lots of, of desired kind of above and beyond qualifications um, that we look for. And, you know, as far as kind of hard, you know, competency is, um, I'll, I'll just leave it, you know, it's a huge wide range, right, because we cover so much in the pharmaceutical space from, you know, a, a actual manufacturing space as well. Uh, but then also where I sit in agriculture as well. So we have lots of labs, right? Even, even here in Woodland, we have two, two different labs. I actually just checked, checked with our lab lead and um, quite a few of the entry-level kind of technician roles too. We also source from like Aerotech. And, you know, you can also think about uh, like that's, that's where I started as well was, was as like a contractor position. Um, that's also a great opportunity for us from a workforce perspective. And then kind of the same thing as Barry was saying, thinking about using that and, and gaining those skills and transferring those moving forward. We also do have lots of internships as well. Um, and you can also find that just on the, the job posting page within Bayer. And they'll list there. Um, and these internships range, again, across a whole wide range. I actually just pulled one up to look at um, as we were talking here. And this one is actually in our vegetable division. And, and they're going to be kind of working on some, working with some of our pepper breeders, collecting our phenotypic, genotypic data. And, and this ask is for somebody who's working towards um, a higher level advanced degree. Thanks so much, uh, Laura. Lara. Uh, that is a very specific um, um, job posting that really helps us understand what this um, this field looks like in our area. So thank you for that. Um, Craig, I'm going to pass the mic to you next. Thank you. Um, so we've been hiring uh, a lot uh, over the last few years. Uh, Milteni has been growing at about 30% rate. Um, so we're really struggling to keep up the demand and bring people in. Um, we hired about 11 uh, positions just purely into the service division last year, and we're probably projecting another 14 for, for next year. Majority of those positions are field-based. Um, and as an industry for kind of field service engineers, it's, it's a difficult time for us. It, it's um, across the industry, if you talk to sort of peers, um, uh, Agilent and um, Thermo and other companies, you know, they, they struggle to bring in um, service engineers. Uh, it seems to be, a, a, unfortunately, an area where we're um, struggling to attract talent. Um, and the industry is kind of uh, feasting off each other to try and, um, pull people from one to the other, which is kind of, you know, pushing the prices up. Um, so what we're actually moving towards is, is kind of trying to grow our own and trying to bring people in, trying to develop these entry level positions, trying to uh, develop the internal training courses and, and looking more pragmatically at kind of the skill sets that we're bringing in. Typically, we're looking for people that have got really good kind of electromechanical skills, um, obviously need to be able to diagnose and fault find in, inside of um, complex electrical equipment, and then have field-based customer-facing experience so that you're traveling all the time and you're out, which, which seems to be, you know, one of the negative sides for some people. Uh, everybody kind of really likes the hybrid role these days. The thought of actually going out to different workplaces every day can be a bit of a scary concept for, for somebody entering the workforce. And um, then we're looking for people that have got scientific experience, people that can walk into laboratories, converse with, you know, PhDs, um, researchers, uh, people in manufacturing suites. So it's a real, really hard skill set for us to get and bring together and find those individuals. So we've developed pathways. We're, we're looking at onboarding people that maybe have two out of the three skills that we're looking for. We're looking for people that have good um, baseline educational skills, um, particularly things around uh, IT, computer literacy. A lot of the stuff's very electronic based, uh, a lot of communication uh, skill sets, being able to be customer facing and, and out there in the world. And, you know, ultimately people that are good at collaborating, uh, good at teamwork, working within small teams, but also can be self-sufficient. Um, I'm a big advocate of kind of vocational work. Um, we bring a lot of um, people in from um, 
the military. We have a lot of Navy professionals that have been with us a long time. And we also outreach to, to colleges as well to, to try and bring in some people from the sort of surrounding area. So I think last year we actually brought in two people that were working or had been working with um, Sierra College uh, on their mechatronics course. They're now working for us at kind of entry level aspects here, doing quality control of inbound inspections. And that then helps them progress to kind of, we can start to train them and give the other necessary skills as we go forward. And, and that's really going to be the pathway for us is kind of looking at what are the tangible skills people have got, the transferable ones that we can use. And when we're going to have to train them ourselves. I mean, we have to anyway. The instruments are complicated to get inside a, a two photon, you know, ultra microscope is, is something we have to train people to do over years. So, you know, we just need to make sure they have the right skill set, the right mentality to be able to do those jobs. Thanks so much, Craig. Um, I think we have two more panelists for this question. I'm going to pass it to um, Damien, and then Laura will be next. Yeah, I think uh, Barry sit on, hit on some stuff that really hit home for me. And uh, I would say, yeah, most recently in, in the roles that I've had to fill, it's been a more advanced degree, but that's just a coincidence or a situational uh, thing. Uh, certainly in hiring over the last 10 or 15 years for myself, um, it's really about the skills. Like, I, I don't know that I've ever, unless it was for a very specific reason, looked looked at the education. I would, I would say the idea of getting into a lab or getting into an internship or even contacting a small company like ours about, you know, a, a, an internship, a summer internship or, or working part-time in a lab would be a huge step and a big indication to an employer that A, the person uh, can, is, is teachable and they're gonna learn much like uh, Craig said, is a lot of what we do is is so skill based. You have to make sure that someone comes in and isn't going to injure themselves or break something, um, just to make sure that they have the, the necessary skill set. So we we would really really be open at our company right now to to entry level, uh, much like Laura Laura said, you know, technician, associate, assistant. You know, those kind of sometimes contain a, a an educational requirement, but often it's you know not, and a lot of times it's just simply experience. And so coming in and showing a skill set and and being collaborative, working closely with the team, uh, really and approaching the entire uh, experience with really trying to learn and grow as a scientist and figure out you know where where do I, where do I want my career to go are really the attributes that I think that are most attractive. Uh, for for anyone I've worked with as a hiring manager, I think we have a different problem with a small company with with a small name. Is we just generally have a have a real challenge in getting applicants. Uh, we just don't have a lot of people. We don't people aren't scouring bear you know us like they would a bear website uh, because there just there just isn't the name. And so one of the things that might come out of this, I don't know, not not to be a little bit selfish, but if there's ways in which we in the in the in the in the area can connect with uh, job boards, job placements, people looking to hire, or people looking for roles, that would be really attractive because we, we just don't get a lot of applicants up and down the, the, the level um, of, of scientists we're trying to hire. Thanks so much for that, Damien. We have so many great folks joining in on the call, on our panel, really hope to like meet those workforce needs by connecting you all. So really appreciate you, your candor in that and for your, um, you sharing kind of the needs um, for your workforce. And then I'll pass the mic to Laura. I know you guys have a larger organization um, and that Aggie Square is not, you know, yet in uh, like brick and mortared out there yet, but definitely interested in understanding your perspective on this. Yeah, and that's, you know, we don't have the jobs just yet because of the opening not happening until early 2025, but we're definitely planning. I think all of the things that all the other panelists have said have been really good skills. The at first phase one of Aggie Square is 1.2 million square feet. It'll be a mixture of lab, lifelong learning space, and other um, community service uh, functions. But I think um, a between having industry and university, there will be a plethora of all different skill levels that will be needed for these jobs. Everything from a postdoc, PhD, that might be our principal investigators, all the way down to people with bachelor's degrees, um, AA, even on the you know, job, job training for some of our skilled technician workforce, um, for example, um, like the lab technicians or maybe having clinical research coordinators. So some of those will be 
require certificates, some, you know, will be higher degree programs. So I think it can be pretty much all over the map. Um, when you talk about foundational skills or soft skills, um, we do know that, you know, just working with other um, research parks across the country, we're finding that having basic math skills and having reading literacy, financial literacy, critical thinking skills, and those are all things that would be important for any sort of person wanting to go into a job in the biosciences or life sciences. Thanks, Laura, that's really helpful. Appreciate that um, scope. Um, our next question is oriented kind of to um, what opportunities are our current workforce looking or current candidates are looking at. Um, what would you consider, uh, would you consider hiring applicants if they have many, but not all skills asked for in their job description? And this is really leaning into um, what are the essential skills that they need versus something that you are able to train or work with them to develop? And I'll pass that to uh, Craig first. Yeah, I mean, as I mentioned before, it's, we expect to be training people. It's, it's very difficult to bring somebody in with all the skills. Um, definitely computer literacy is, is big on the an ask for us and, and communication skills. Ultimately, I'm, I'm looking for people that are dependable, reliable, and, and going to be turning up for the job. Um, critical thinking, problem solving are really important for um, instruments. Um, that, that's a, a definite skill that we're looking for. I'm not always looking for a degree. We quite often have those things within our postings, but we're quite often looking for a combination of uh, education and experience. And, and we'll kind of, um, you know, accept a, a lower level of education if the experience level is higher. So we, we'll kind of um, mix it up depending on what the job role is and what's required there. Um, we're going to train people with um, the technical side of how to actually get in these instruments and do things, but they need to have that kind of um, mindset to be able to facilitate repair to try and work out why something's not working. We also do an awful lot of work in kind of GMP um, compliant customers. So we need people that have really good kind of integrity, that um, their documentation skill sets and, and the ability to, um, you know, kind of stop when things go wrong. We want people that are kind of going to stop and, and not progress and, and make things worse, you know, which sometimes if you get people that are used to um, too much free thinking, it, it can be problematic for us. You know, we quite often need people that are really good at following an SOP and a procedure and when things go wrong, kind of stopping and asking for support. So for us, it's it's often around these kind of more intangible soft skills. I like vocational qualifications myself personally and, and lean in towards more experience. But if we can't get the experience, then definitely the, the right educational background that can start them off on the right platform. Thanks, Craig. Passing that to Clara. Yeah, I think I, I answered this question actually a little bit in my my last response, um, but I think it's just been interesting listening to to the, the other panelists and kind of thinking through just overall from, you know, a, a biological kind of ecosystem and, you know, that the Craig and, and, you know, smaller companies like Damien, um, you know, we all kind of rely on each other, right, to, to be able to function essentially in, in, you know, ultimately producing a product, an output, and and work with each other in, in a lot of different ways. Um, and so I think hearing kind of the, the opportunities and challenges that, that everybody's facing, I think in terms of, you know, you're, you're never gonna get the perfect person, right? There a lot of the, the jobs and roles that we have now, right there, um, I, I think there's opportunity for everybody to train and develop and, and that has to happen on the job. You know, I think, uh, you know, from a smaller company uh, like Damien's, for example, where you probably do have to wear a lot of different hats and you have to, to know and, and be able to do a lot of different skills, those will have to be trained on the job. Uh, you know, I think Bayer is an interesting uh, place to be because it is so large, but there's smaller kind of pockets um, and uh, areas of the company where that's still the case, right? So I, I've been working in, in the vegetable division that maybe doesn't have all of the same resources um, and you know, opportunities that some of the larger parts of our organization do. Um, and so you know, I think that, that for sure, 
uh, people being really eager and willing to understand to where their strengths are, where they want to grow, what they're interested in, because there's so much, I think, diversity available in you know, the, the area of biotechnology, just taking the time to learn a little bit about that and ask those types of questions too when you come in, in for a, a job interview really goes a long way. And, and then being kind of being able being curious about what skills they can learn in, in those different types of roles and be willing to take, um, I think, take a leap that maybe what they what they're looking at maybe doesn't fit exactly what they think. Um, you know, I think it's interesting to hear the challenges of, of some of uh, these other companies getting um, talent. We have that you know, pockets, right? Things that become kind of hot, you know, and, you know, you think about data and digital work, right? For some of our, our postings, we get, you know, hundreds of thousands of applicants. And then we also have the opposite problem where some of our postings, we get hardly anybody. And, and so I think it's really interesting to kind of think about that as well in terms of helping people be you know open and willing to kind of look beyond maybe what what they think is like the hottest trend or the or the the most interesting thing. Thanks so much. The other Anna. thing, yeah, I was just going to add on to in terms of kind of soft skills. So um, Bayer does have our life values: so leadership, integrity, flexibility, and efficiency. And and for us, anybody going through the hiring process, right? Me as a hiring manager. We use that uh, as our kind of base grounding, and you can find that, you know, all of those resources for anybody coming in and, and going through an interview process to be, become really familiar with what those are. And those are really the soft skills that we use, you know, performance evaluations and, and really think about how that comes together, right, and how we actually execute what we do at Bayer. Thanks, Laura. That's a great interview tip for those folks coming into the field, just looking at, you know, the mission of the organizations that they're going into. Um, I, I recognize that the last question did touch on skills, so I might pivot to the next question oriented to hiring and how you folks, um, what the process is for recruitment for you all, and, um, and does your organization currently um, facilitate or work with students or host uh, internships? And I'm going to pass the mic to Damien for that question first. Thanks. Yeah. Um, so we, we we do internships. We're a smaller group, so it's it's sort of small scale, but we're totally open to it. It it has to, I don't know, sort of be something that that makes a lot of sense both for the the company, of course, but also for the individual. So it it's not something we commonly do. Um, I think this relates to the previous sort of question as well. And, and I would share just my own personal philosophy coming up uh, as a research assistant right out of basically undergrad in, in an environment that was just very, very, very strong culturally and, and had a lot of really, really positive outside of the work environments. And so it's really influenced my, my thinking um, about hiring. And I would say I almost ne I've almost never hired somebody with 100% of the skills. I just I, I expect to to train, and so the things that to me really really stand out for any of your students who are looking is 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 just an absolute excitement about uh, the company, the work, and a, a desire to learn, and a real interest and an enthusiasm that really comes across, you know, in any kind of interaction with anybody from the company. Lots and lots of questions, uh, lots and lots of interest in in what the opportunities really look like, what the what the real world situation is with the job, not, not just the work, but also the culture. And then I would say I I, I use LinkedIn. So I would really encourage anybody in, in your group that's on the job market to use LinkedIn. And I, I will get on a phone call with almost anyone and just answer questions about an opening or answer questions about my experience working in the industry and how, and how my career has gone. I've done this many, many times. So I find that generally applicants are just really hesitant to take advantage or, or just sort of show their level of interest um, and, and get, get themselves into a conversation with somebody who can spread the resume, you know, or if they don't have an opening that's a good fit, talk to friends in the industry who 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 might be. So, just sort of dovetailing the two the two questions, um, we do internships, uh, we're open to that, but but really, I would say, 
there's a lot that can be done from the candidate's perspective to really show that if there is a seven, you know, maybe only 75% match or 50% match on the skill set, there's a lot of reason to bring them on board that are outside the skill set because the company is really going to invest time and energy with them. And they want to invest time and energy with people who are really committed and interested and, and really wanting to contribute, learn, get to know people and grow their own career. Thanks, Damian. Very glad to have you back joining us. Sorry for the tech issues. Um, the question we were asking was really oriented to like your recruitment and um, uh, opportunities for students um, at your organization. Yeah, I, I I think I briefly mentioned we we really take advantage of being really closely located at UC Davis. Um, the internship and career center there puts on it's like four or five career fairs every year. Um, we're, we are there every time and it's been a way. And I, I really, um, <laughs> I really connect with what Damien said uh, earlier, where it's like, it, it's hard for a small company to get your name out sometimes and, and for people to even know you exist. And, and it was very, you know, when, when I first started at IGEA, we had like 12, 14 people. And when we were going through this massive growth phase, we couldn't get enough applicants. Um, so it, it took a lot of foot, footwork for us, just boots on the ground at, at the career fairs, um, at events like these, any anywhere we could um, kind of join, put up a table just to get our, our name out there so people knew, oh, okay, I'll check out Hygieia um, and, and see what kind of jobs they have out there. Uh, so we do a lot of face-to-face -face, uh, that's more just like engagement with students. Uh, if we have positions that we're hiring for at the time, we'll, we'll have flyers there to pass out. Um, but a lot of uh, what we are using is Indeed. We just do a lot of um, job postings on Indeed. There was a time we even used Craigslist uh, for, for stuff when we were real small and we, we couldn't even afford um, to post something on Indeed. We were just, all right, let's put it up on Craigslist and see what we get. And, and we, we would luck out. Um, and just to kind of follow up on, on most of the other um, panelists saying, we, we really expect to have to train new employees. Um, I, I think I mentioned it early on. I would expect someone has been in a laboratory before and generally knows what not to do um, for, for safety reasons. We, we don't want people in there that are breaking stuff. I think Craig brought this up. Um, gonna, gonna go in there and, and break something that costs $10,000 to replace, anything like that. So, um, you know, a lot of the positions we're, we're doing a lot of, I would say we're doing a lot of microbiology related work um, at our company. But we hire uh, psychology majors, uh, uh, material science people, uh, people who are not traditionally like microbiology or even life science majors, uh, we hire in. And I think kind of Damien touched on a little bit a second ago where he was saying, we're, we're looking for kind of the quality, the interest level, people are interested and want to be in there and are asking questions. And you get that from an interview. If they're in there in the interview and they're engaged and they're asking about your company, they're 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 interested. And I think that's a lot of what science is, is just that um, question, curiosity uh, that people have, I think is really, really important um, soft skill. Thanks so much, Barry. Passing it to Craig. Yes, I'm, I'm very fortunate. We have our own kind of internal recruitment um, department. So I actually get to work with uh, a team of two or three recruiters when we, we actually place um, ads nationally. Um, we do a lot of work on, on LinkedIn, um, which brings in you know quite a few candidates as well. That kind of whole networking thing is, is really useful. Um, but we also reach out to this kind of local community. As I said before, we, we've worked with, um, I think we've had about two or three successful people through the kind of mechatronics course. Uh, at Sierra College. Uh, we currently have an intern right now um, that's from UC Davis Engineering Program. Um, she's actually it was supposed to have finished her, her intern at the end of the summer, but is staying on one day a week to, to sort of continue, you know, growing skills in that area. So it's definitely something that, that we're keen to do is, is work at multiple levels. You know, when we post we don't get anywhere near enough applicants. You know, typically, you, you, by the time you get down to a, a short list, you're looking at onesies and twosies of people. It's, it's a small pool that you're pulling through, and, and even the original, you know, pool that you bring in isn't that big. You know, ten or fifteen in some some positions. So, we have to use multiple avenues to try and bring in as many qualified candidates as possible. Thanks, Craig. 
I'm wondering with the time that we have, um, can uh, I add some, can I add something too? Oh, of course. Of course. <laughs> just something Craig said just made me realize there's, I don't know if other panelists are experiencing this, but there's this really big trend, uh, at least for us of, of being ghost, what, what the term is like ghosted by applicants where we will get, say we get 10 candidates submit a resume. We pick our top four or five, three, maybe we'll even set up an interview. 50%, 30 to 50%, you never hear back from them. No communication at all. And it, this is like a new last two years, I would say, kind of during COVID, after COVID, we've really been experiencing that. Um, and, and it's really frustrating. So we, we think we have our top three on paper. We're going to interview these three and maybe one shows up for the interview. And, and that's really hard when we're hiring. Thanks, Barry, for sharing that. That's terrible. I'm sorry to hear that. And I saw Damien raise his hand a little bit. Just some advice for our workforce and uh, education folks. Tell your students to be have some etiquette. That's so mean. I apologize that that happens. Um, just with the time that we have for the panel, I just wanted to do like a quick uh, run through of all of the panelists, just kind of what you predict, short, sweet, and simple, like for the next three to five years for your organization. Um, and I'll start with uh, Laura. Yeah, well, three to five years is about the time we're, we're working on right now for things. So um, I think the biotech and life sciences industry is going to continue to grow. I think we're going to see a lot more efforts and diversity. So um, a lot of the career exploration programs and um, internships and things that we'll plan on doing and partnering with both university and with industry, I think will um, We'll be moving forward. I think we'll see a lot more in kind of the AI and digital space. And um, I know we have a short time, so I'll, I'll wrap up with that. Thanks so much, Laura. Very insightful. I'm going to pass it to Laura. Yeah, I think the, the same things very much for us. AI digital is huge, um, you know, especially in the agriculture space focus on robotics automation is, is going to be a, a big need um, but I, I think too um, thinking about skills overall you know as somebody coming in to an organization I think having um, at least familiarity with the the major kind of areas of biotechnology is a key plus I think everybody here is listed and shown that you're gonna to have to kind of specialize and you're gonna get that training wherever you go. But being able to communicate and connect across a huge wide range, right? Everybody here, you know, as you go through your career, you're going to specialize, you're going to develop skills um, and it may be in a particular area, but you have to be able to communicate. And, and for us, thinking about where we're going in terms of sustainability, so really being a sustainable agricultural company, that is connecting through biologics, crop protection, our data and digital pieces, and really driving towards a kind of a holistic way of looking at all these pieces together to drive an end product. And that needs a lot of people with a lot of different um, technologies and skills, but you have to understand that and be able to communicate that well um, across a lot of different teams. Thanks, Laura. Craig? Yeah, so from my mind, what I, what I see over the next sort of three to five years, I mean, we've had a huge explosion in the scientific industry in terms of money pouring in coming from COVID. Um, and I think we're going to see a slowdown in that money pouring in, but, you know, the, it's still going to continue to grow. It's always been a very strong growth industry for us. Um, we're seeing massive growth in cell and gene therapy. That, that's really where kind of um, the industry is moving and, you know, we're projecting to probably be double our size in the next four years, four to five years. So we're going to be, you know, employing and bringing in a lot more people to kind of meet that growth in these tailored medicines and the kind of technology that's involved, you know, means it's, it's very kind of labor intensive. Um, they're, they're trying to automate it as much as possible, but we're still going to need a lot of people out there to support all of these unique um, CAR T cell treatments that are going to be coming through. Thanks, Craig. Uh, Damien? Yeah, so um, specifically to Bioconsortia, we're on a growth trajectory. We're going to be doing an expansion in our space, and so there'll be 
more opportunities there. Uh, we're a small company, about 35 or 40 in Davis. So we might, we might hit the 50 number um, in the next year or so. Um, so that's good uh, across ag. I, I think if, if I was a younger person thinking about where I thought I would want to make a career, I, th I think areas of in inside growth of vegetables. Um, there's a Gotham Green site that just went up off of 80. I would be looking in that space, but I would definitely, I don't, this may be naive of me to say for the type of educational programs that we're talking about, but anything in data, anything around understanding data, working with data, uh, visualizing data, if, if the individual is at all interested in, in programming on their own, if they're not in those types of classes, any type of that type of skills is going to be really attractive because ultimately that's where a lot of the, the larger companies, a lot of the industry is going, just really figuring out how to work with data and capturing more data. Um, yeah, I, I, I too share some of Craig's concern that some of the VC money is going to start to go down a little bit. I don't know how that will impact the, the Sacramento area. Um, but I do think that we're 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 got a heavy footprint in agriculture, and I see some growth in alternatives to meat. I think that'd be another area of really interest as um, as we try to go to some of the net zero ideas and concepts. Um, and you see some of the synthetic bi synthetic biology inventions and and uh, advances moving outside of maybe the hardcore sciences and in other areas. So it will be interesting to see what happens. Thanks, Damian. Really good segue to Barry. Thanks. Yeah, I think um, Hygieia is kind of on this kind of growth about adding 30 people every three to five years. Um, and I don't see that changing. So 30 to 50 people, um, about 10. And this is like new, um, new positions that would be opening up. I, I agree with Jamie. It was something he touched on at the end, like um, the, the fake meat, uh, synthetic meat stuff is, is big, um, starting to get bigger and bigger. A number of people who have left here uh, have ended up, or I've, I've known colleagues who were in kind of similar roles as I, I have now transitioned into that. Um, it's very, it sounds weird, but it's a very similar um, technique. If, if you're a microbiologist is, is transitioning over there. So I, I know of a number of companies in Sacramento area, Bay area um, that are doing pretty well right now. Thanks Barry, looking forward to seeing what that looks like in our region. Um, I want to just thank all of the panelists for their time, their expertise, and for sharing um, kind of resources and information. Um, we're going to pivot now to sharing some highlights of, of the programs that are supplying our workforce. And we're going to start with Adam Tolene at American River College. So we're just going to pull up those slides for him real quick and welcome Adam um, to the conversation. Oh, Oh, I apologize. I did this in the previous um, session. If there's any questions from the audience that uh, for our panelists before we move into this, um, just feel free to, uh, are, are there any in the chat, Gus or Angelina? I had a uh, question, but I think it, it, they, they addressed it already. It was about hiring folks without bachelor's degrees. Um, but I, I think the, the, the panelists talked about that, so I'm, I'm happy to, happy to hear their responses to that. Thanks, Adam. Just gonna give it one more quick um, moment if there's any other questions in the audience for our panel. Sorry to jump the gun again. All right, thank you all. We will move into that next segment. Thanks, Gus. So I'm, I'm gonna introduce Adam Talim. He's the assistant professor for our biology and biotechnology program at American River College. Actually a professor now. <laughs> oh, thank you for that. Congrats. Thank you. Okay, so I probably have too many slides for the time we've got here. Many, some of the slides in here are just for reference for the slide deck afterwards for some details of our program. Uh, so my name is Adam Talene. Um, I coordinate American River College's biotechnology program. Um, our program has been going on for over 20 years at this point, although I've only been running it since 2018. Um, and you can go to the next slide. 
Uh, so our, our main goal is to train students for entry-level positions in biotechnology. I guess what our panelists were calling the technician jobs. Um, and we're, we also want to train students to, or prepare students for transferring to four-year institutions. So we've got a mixed, mixed bag of students. Some of them want to go directly from our degree or certificate into the workforce. Others are um, you know, planning to transfer to UC Davis or Sacramento State or other, other um, four-year institutions. And so we try to provide important concepts and applications, get them ready to really succeed in their upper division courses and give them some practical hands-on skills, particularly uh, in the lab, so they know their way around there. Um, next slide. Uh, so we offer both a uh, certificate as well as uh, an associate's degree. And this is just some of the details from our, from our catalog there. Um, so we can go on to the next slide. Um, and although, um, as Aaron noted, we don't end up awarding a ton of degrees, um, but we have been recently in the top five community colleges in the state um, for degree certificate completion uh, in, in biotech and, and life sciences. Um, you can go on to the next one. Um, so our, our students um, have different educational goals. Um, like I mentioned before, many of them are intending to basically go directly from ARC into the job market. Others are planning to transfer. So uh, we try to balance our program to accommodate both. Um, and then as, as was discussed um, there earlier, we actually have a number of students who are already have bachelor's degrees and come back to us to get the hands-on lab skills to make them more competitive in the, in the job market. Um, and um, our enrollments, as Aaron noted, are, are pretty small. Um, I think that's a problem across the whole state. That's certainly not unique to American River College. Um, and we can go on to the next slide. Uh, so we offer a variety of courses here, um, and we probably don't have time to go through all the details of the courses, but they're, uh, they're, they're in a variety of modalities, including entirely asynchronous online courses, as well as, you know, in-person, hands-on, intensive laboratory things. We also have a few courses for sort of um, independent exploration study or work experience internships. Um, you can go on to the next slide. And we can skip through these slides pretty quickly. Um, so um, our... Uh, go, ahead, go ahead and go to the next one. So our introductory course is Biotech 307. This is an online course, um, and we're trying to just provide an overview of biotechnology, kind of the lay of the land uh, for students. This is also an ideal course for uh, students who aren't sure if they're interested in biotech um, to kind of see if it's see if it's for them, um, get an idea of that. And so we go over a lot of basic biology and molecular biology concepts. Um, we don't get delve very deep in this course. We're trying to, you know, give, give students a wide breadth of, of um, background in biotechnology. You can go on to the next one. And you can skip to the next one right after this. Um, so our main lecture course is um, called Biotechnology and Human Health. But despite the title, it actually uh, covers a lot more than just medical biotech and things related to human health. Um, so this is really kind of the... the um, what's for the sort of the, the, the meat of, of the con conceptual component of our program um, where we do oh, we, we continue the overview of biotechnology but now we start to delve more deeply into specific fields um, get into molecular genetics human genetics we talk a lot about recombinant DNA tools um, and genomics bioinformatics um, how we can use those technologies across lots of different applications um, and we kind of round out the, the semester talking about ethical issues and go on to the next slide um, and yeah, skip to the, you can skip through this one too. Okay, so um, our cap our capstone courses are our laboratory courses, um, and we have we have two of these, and they're both short courses, so they only run for half a semester, and they're designed to be taken together, kind of as if they were one larger four unit course. Um, and across uh, the two lab classes, we uh, try to cover broad base of laboratory skills. Um, so we cover basic laboratory, uh, you know, how to handle yourself in a lab, talking about lab safety, regulatory processes, um, regulations, and so on. And then we try to get into um, some specific key basic skills. So that includes things like micropipetting, of course. We have students extracting uh, DNA of various sorts, using doing en enzyme um, reactions, setting up PCRs, including primer design. We you know, do construct recombinant DNA. We do protein chromatography. Uh, we teach the students about uh, basic things that are sometimes missed in university lab courses, like solution and media preparation. 
Um, we try to make sure that our students have a good good handle on that. Uh, we do a lot of uh, we work mostly with with microorganisms and plants because unfortunately we don't have the resources and facilities for things like animal cell culture, um, which I would love to include in our program, but just it's not viable at least at the moment. Um, so we try to make up for that by um, you know getting good principles for like aseptic technique and things that would apply to that even if we can't have the students do an, do an actual animal cell culture, you know, hands on. Uh, we also try to um, talk a bit about data analysis. We do enzyme assays. We have students graphing data, doing statistics on it um, and so on. We, we do protein work. Um, we have for a long time been doing SDS page gel labs and we've recently um, added a Western blot module to that to get students some um, some more experience. And one of the other things we do in those um, lab courses is we talk a lot about the regulated laboratory workplace. Um, and, um, you know, again, that, in, that includes safety. Um, we also uh, talk about uh, GMP uh, documentation and we um, have students keep lab notebooks. And I'm working on um, trying to adapt the course to include uh, things rather than just like straight up lab notebooks, more of like the forms and batch records and, and kinds of things that would go into GMP and uh, the students would see going into industry. Um, so you can go, go to the next slide. Um, yeah, there we go. Uh, we also offer a, uh, a very short intro to bioinformatics course. This is a pretty lightweight course. Um, it's only one unit and it's entirely online. Um, this is not really like uh, coding, um, you know, big data type bioinformatics. It's more what kind of you know, just the lay of the land in terms of the public databases, how to retrieve, um, you know, sequence records, how to find uh, journal articles and databases. Um, and we, we talk a bit about genomics, teach students how to use BLAST. So this is um, kind of a lot of the really, really, really basic stuff. I would love to uh, expand this course in the future. Um, and we actually did a trial run of a dual enrollment uh, section of this with Sheldon High School. And we'll hear from, from Justin Cecil in a minute um, in spring 2022. Um, that, that went all right. There was a little bit rocky, but I think we learned a lot and we're hoping to, um, you know, kind of expand our dual enrollment offerings to try to bring in more students from, from the high school into our program. Uh, next slide. Um, okay, here we go. Um, so we've been working to update our labs to try to give uh, students um, a more uh, a lab experience that's not like your typical sort of cookie cutter labs, like a lot of lab courses. So we have recently reworked a lot of our labs so that they're sort of more connected to each other, where rather than being standalone labs, it's like the material you generate from the first lab activity is what you start with in the second lab activity and so on. So we've done things where we you know, have the students um, you know, um, engineer GFP into E. coli, then use hydrophobic interaction chromatography to purify it, and then run it out and do analysis and, and look at the purity of their protein on, you know, page gels and, and so on. Um, we've also tried to, started to try to include um, what are called authentic learning experiences in the science education community um, that are supposed to be more real world things rather than like cookie cutter labs. And so, um, there is a grant project that um, ARC is working with in conjunction, and actually uh, several other Los Rios colleges with Sacramento State called the Sirius II Project, uh, which is funded through NSF. And one of the things that we've done for that is create an ale for our lab courses where we do bioprospecting. So we have students bring in soil samples and then we screen soil microbes for amylase production. And then we, we try to quantify their amylase activity and compare them to known strains and then you know archive them and um, you know, kind of, kind of follow up with those. And so this is trying to give students kind of a, a snapshot of like what they might see in industry. Um, so let's see, next slide. Um, we're also trying to, so we have, we have problems with enrollment issues um, and we're trying to raise awareness of our program. So one of the ways we're doing that is trying to insert biotech lab activities into some of our other biology classes so that students who are already on campus but didn't know about our program become aware of it. Um, we've been doing that in our um, majors biology class, cell molecular class, as well as um, our microbiology classes. And we're currently about to start an overhaul of some of our curricula for our bioinformatics course and our introductory biotech and society class. So I would love if anybody has any suggestions for topics um, that should be included or should be emphasized um, that would help students you know, in, in, in the next few years, that would be wonderful. Uh, next slide. 
Um, we've started to accumulate a lot of equipment um, over the last few years. So we've started to get things that um, you know, students might see in, in uh, industry laboratories. We've recently got a nanodrop instrument, a bioanalyzer, which was actually a donation from Bayer Crop Science in Woodland. Thank you. We really appreciate that. And we've upgraded our gel documentation system. Um, we also got an ultra cold freezer and autoclave. Now we had those before, but the new thing about this is there are smaller versions that we can have in our teaching lab so that students get to actually uh, you know, interact with those when they're making freezer stocks, growing things out of those, or preparing their media and solutions, uh, where previously we weren't able to do that. We've also got a Western blot device to include Western blot modules. And we actually just got a QPCR machine, so we're excited to start to include some quantitative PCR in our lab activities as well. Uh, next slide. Um, so we do a lot of stuff outside of our classes, too, um, to try to help students get, get some experience. So um, we try to take, take field trips. So we've gone to like UC Davis Genome Center Symposia. We've taken students on lab tours at uh, some research labs at Sacramento State and USDA laboratories on the UC Davis campus. Um, we've also uh, taken students to uh, some research conferences. So back in the spring, I took a group of students to the SynBioBeta Built with Biology Conference. A race against the clock event. Um, you can see our contingent from ARC here. And then down on the bottom right is um, uh, a bunch of community college students and faculty from across the state who are, who, who joined us at that meeting. Uh, next slide. We also um, try to um, give students opportunities to do research. We're working on building up our opportunities here. Um, so we have a group on campus. Um, previously, it was the Biotech Club. Now it's called the Real STEM Coalition uh, Student Research Group, um, where we do a lot of different activities. This semester, we've been running a lot of basic skills workshops in preparation for a project we're hoping to start up in the spring, um, as well as and in the past, we've done all sorts of different, um, different things with that. Next slide. Um, we also have multiple ongoing lab projects so that students can get involved um, with uh, research projects outside of class to give them more real world experience. Since, as we heard from our panelists, a lot of uh, a lot of them are looking for like lab experience outside of coursework. Um, so we have done things like take the Piglo teaching plasmid with the green fluorescent protein, and we've done site directed mutagenesis to create different colored versions of it. Um, to kind of show how we can we can do that. We are in the middle of a project where we're engineering strains of E. coli to produce carotenoid pigments, and we've cloned the genes out of the plant pathogen P. agglomerans and are working on constructing the, the vectors to express those with inducible promoters. And we have um, some other, other projects in their early stages, including one where we're hoping to take students out to sample uh, water from the American River at various locations, and then um, do 16S ribosomal DNA sequencing so we can do basically metagenomics, look at my microbial populations. And our hope there is to set up an ongoing sort of data collection framework um, so that we can basically look at changes in microbial populations over the years and students can you know, contribute to that. It gives, it gives students an opportunity to kind of communicate the results and kind of be part of a larger sort of research project. So we're hoping to get the lab work involved and in our, our protocols designed in the spring. Next slide. Um, we can skip this one. We've COVID had some, some impacts on our, our program. Um, so some of the challenges that we're facing are low enrollments. And so I think that um, it seems like, you know, hearing from the panelists that some job app, some jobs, they don't get very many applicants. We, uh, that, that may be downstream in the pipeline from us. We don't have that many students coming into our program. And we took enrollment hits uh, during, the, during the pandemic as well. Um, talking to my community college colleagues running other biotech programs around the state, they're seeing similar things. And I, I think this is kind of in line with the general trend in the community colleges now, not just in biotech programs where the enrollments are you know, just kind of coming down. So I think we need to figure out how to raise awareness about about programs like ours and bring more students in. And I'm, I'm hoping that um, you know, industry uh, maybe can step up and help us some with this. Um, but I'm not sure what the, you know, what, what the best approach is, but clearly we need more outreach and advertising. And we're still working to develop more hands-on practice for students to get that lab experience. Um, and we're always looking to find internships and job opportunities uh, for, for students. And we've been having trouble tracking student data after they leave the program. Um, you know, so that that's something we need to figure out how to do better. The community college system is getting a little better at, at doing that. Um, and um, let's see, I think you can go on to the next slide. Oh, that's the end. Oh, no. 
So we're always um, happy to answer any questions um, or listen to any comments or suggestions you have. Um, and it looks like the URL got cut off. I didn't use PowerPoint to put these slides together. So I think that's why some of the stuff is mangled. Um, but hopefully there'll be a version of this in the, um, you know, the, the post meeting slides that have the link to our, our program site and my contact information there. So um, thanks very much. Thanks so much, Adam. And uh, some that question uh, kind of puts us in the great position to kind of tangent over to our high school um, advocate. Um, he's the coordinate, coordinator of Sheldon High School's Biotechnology Academy. Um, and we'll just spend a few minutes learning about their program before wrapping up. Thank you so much, Adam. Good morning. Hi, I'm Justin. Um, and we can stop sharing. Thank you so much. Okay. So just real quick, um, very appreciative to be here. It's always um, great from my point of view to see what industry wants. Um, in some ways, it affirms what we do. Kind of been doing this a while. I'll, I'll get into that in a minute. But then it, the interesting part is the challenges that you guys are facing as industry, that Adam's facing at the community college level. I can kind of tell why being at the at the bottom, I can kind of give you guys some insight as to why, at least speaking from our student population. So um I've been teaching for 25 years since the, the school opened, kind of a product of UC Davis. Sheldon, it's a little bit about the high school. Sheldon is the third most diverse high school in California, number 20 in the um, United States. We have, we're Title I school. More than 50% of our population is free and reduced lunch. We have about 40% of our students, our English language learners have been designated, redesignated as, as fluent. We have a large immigrant population. And when we start to talk about awareness, when they come to my program as freshmen, like why are you here? Well, I, I or my parents want me to be a doctor or a nurse or a pharmacist. That is, that is, I think that's part of all of our problem. We're talking about this awareness. It starts at the, it starts at the home. That's all that there is tunnel vision. That's all that they're aware of. So we're very aware of it in our program that it's our job to show the, the students and their families. These are all the opportunities that are available in science and medicine Okay, beyond just those kind of three very narrow um, things. We started in 2002, just kind of as um, some electives. Let's have some, you know, some science electives beyond the normal biology, chemistry, and physics. We were kind of limited in what we could do. And luckily enough, in 2008, we became a California Partnership Academy, which we get an annual grant from the state of California. That opened up the doors a lot. Um, with the money from the grant, the easiest way to describe the program at this point now is we're a school within a school. So Sheldon has 2,700 students. The kids apply to be in our program and interview. We have 360 students across four grade levels. There's a CTE class with all the technical skills at each grade level. All four classes are A through G, so they get college credit for it on their applications. Um, soft skills, hearing that, that's like I said, it firms, it's nice to sit in on these things, hearing you guys like soft skills in addition to the technical skills. Soft skills, everything you guys mentioned is embedded in all four years of our program. And the, we tell the kids, the reality is you're going to be better prepared for life and your career, regardless of what you end up doing after the end of the four years. Um, so totally value you guys' view on, on the soft skills. And as far as the, 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 the CTE classes that starting as freshmen, micro pipettes, electrophoresis, media prep, microbial um, cultivation, electrophoresis, all of that stuff, aseptic technique. So all four years, they get it. One of our biggest challenges has always been part of the, the CTE model is they have uh, mentors, which we, that's, we did it in junior year, and then they're supposed to do junior, senior year internships. And that's always been a hard part, like a traditional internship, because who really wants, for a lot of times, for liability reasons, high school students in their, in their labs. So we do place kids in labs. So like uh, CIRM has 10 internships every summer. We typically get five to seven of those for our students that, you know, do stem cell research. But for the rest of the students, and a lot of times transportations are, is an issue as well. So what we did is we created a, we would call it a CCL project. It's a community connected learning. So by the, the kids are seniors in groups of three to five kids, they will choose a research topic. We pair them with a PhD student from UC Davis who they have to, they have to complete an application for their research. They have a budget and then using all the equipment, the techniques that they've learned the last four years, they do a year long research project collaboratively 
with each other with the oversight of a PhD student from UC Davis. So that's one of the ways that we can actually give them not just a, you know, a canned lab SOP, which we do in all CT, but this is where they're actually doing science. So some of the projects are like bioplastics, biofuels, uh, microbiomes, there's a wide variety, just using all the kind of the, you know, the equipment and the stuff that they have, um, they have learned. Um, our big challenge is, like I said, overcoming the awareness, and then it's just providing opportunities for guest speakers, that's where they they hear it. Um, guest speakers, e mentors, internships, and what we found like now that we've progressed, been kind of around for twenty years, our advisory board like Dr. Talene's on it, um, UC Davis is on it, some other local companies. Um, but what we found is our the best awareness for us is having our alumni come back. So now on our alumni board, and we have like when we first started, you know, like a lot of the kids that would come back were just, okay, became a doctor, nurse, whatever else. Now we have such a wide variety in all the different industries. That's what's really taken our program and the opportunities and open up the kids' minds is the fact that they were providing these opportunities, but just in, I don't want to say, but non-traditional science and kind of medicine thing that, that that's what these kids are and their families are used to um, hearing. Talking about just like a, you guys were, you know, pressing the importance of when they're in college, you get internships and stuff like that. So last year we had 84 graduates. They were all UC CSU eligible, probably about 70% go to a four-year school. The rest go to community colleges, typically for financial reasons. But in the last, whatever couple months, we've had five of the graduates have gotten jobs in labs at college based upon their resume that they take from, take from here. So we hear what you guys need. We are doing our best. <laughs> and there is hope. I mean, there is a huge want on the kids. Like I said, we have, luckily enough, it's just, it's, I think it's, it's like a lot of things, the product shows itself. So the kids now, we have, I've had, this year I have my first, this is how old I am. I have my first student, student or you know, child in the program. So kind of the full circle. So I know we're kind of getting to the, the time and I don't want to take any more, more time, but I, we do appreciate all, of, you know, the insight that you guys give to us so we can better prepare these kids for a future. So hopefully in, you know, three to five years, you guys see them. Okay. And you guys' place of work. So thank you. Thank you so much, Justin and Adam. Really appreciate the work you guys are doing to build these students up and build their capacity to apply for jobs uh, for the organizations here today. And I apologize for the time constraint. I really wanna thank everyone. Um, if we could pull up that slide, Gus. Thank everyone on our panel, all of our audience members, Gustavo and Angelina for bringing this uh, event together. And we're gonna put in the uh, chat um, a post-event survey for folks. Um, and we're here to facilitate those conversations for you all. So please reach out. Um, we want to connect you all so that we can improve those programs and help support that workforce. I hope you all have a great day and enjoy your lunches. Take care, everyone. Thank you.